OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Good morning or good afternoon, I guess it is right now. <laughs> Let me start the uh, PowerPoint here. <clears throat> Okay, so um, my name is Greg Ludwa. I'm a uh, senior teacher at the Monterey County Office of Education. Um, I'm, I am sort of in charge, not the administrator, but I'm in charge of the adult education program for the California Adult Education Program. And Maribel Hernandez is here with me. She's a, a paraprofessional three and a teacher for our workforce readiness at the Monterey County Jail with me. Uh, we both also have independent study students and um, along with us is also Josh, Jocelyn Rios, our educational liaison at the Monterey County Office of Education. Our administrator was not able to be here today because he's at a parent conference for his daughter. So um, let's just get started here and go on. So uh, what I want to talk about is um, what we're going to look at during this presentation. And uh, what I'm thinking about is, you know, I want to go over the 20, 21st century skills and competencies, which inform our high set and high school diploma program. I'm going to focus mostly on the high set. Um, because uh, we have been, I have been teaching math for 38 years. Uh, at different and 27 years here at the County Office of Education, um, but currently I'm mostly teaching the math and teaching the high school diploma for the CAPE program with incarcerated adults. I've taught incarcerated juveniles and college incarcerated juveniles who are on what I would call um, moderate term incarceration. And then from we took over the Monterey County Jail educational program in 2017. So I'm gonna tell how we're incorporating the high set prep for both our incarcerated adults and our non-incarcerated adults. I did uh, present in during the pandemic in at the TDLS in 2021, and we're gonna go over some of the same things, but uh, not focus so much on the distance learning part of it today as on how we actually can, we are successful present, preparing people for the high set. And uh, we will talk a little bit about technology and I, I'd like you to be in, you know, in, engaged and answer the questions uh, as, you, as you see fit. And if you have questions, Maribel will be monitoring the chat for us. So as I said, uh, my name is Greg Ludwa. I've been around for a while, getting a little bit long in the tooth here. And uh, Maribel Hernandez is my paraprofessional three at the Monterey County Jail. And uh, she is also the workforce readiness teacher. She is taking charge of the workforce readiness with us in the jail. Um, so I just want to look at what they call the four C's of the 21st century skills, which inform the common core standards and then our adult education standards also, the college and career readiness standards, which are derived from the um, common core standards. Um, since most of my time has been spent in the K-12 environment or actually, yeah, well, seventh through 12 environment, uh, I'm pretty informed on the common core. Um, critical thinking is one of our important ideas uh, in preparing students for the high set. Um, and it's also one of the, the four C's of the 21st century skills. Communication, uh, also very important for us uh, because we work one-on-one -on -one individually with students. Um, I am tr try to inform them to communicate with me when they are going to have to postpone, reschedule, or when they will come on. Uh, collaboration, working together as a team, of course, very important in the 21st century. And then also uh, creativity, particularly creativity in the area of problem solving when we come to the high set. So um, we worked uh, pretty much with uh, this, a group from New Zealand 
And uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about four dimensional education is uh, first of all, knowledge, what we know and what we understand. Um, skills, how we're gonna be able to use what we know. And this again, is very important for our high set preparation program and our high school diploma program for adults. Character, how we behave and engage in the world. Certainly uh, something that comes up in our national politics at this time. And then also we're very involved in the meta learning of our adults and how they reflect and adapt to new environments, how they are resilient and how they uh, come together and solve problems for themselves. So the 21st century education involves all four of these issues, not just knowledge as I may have learned when I was in school during the 1960s. So um, looking at this four dimensional education, uh, there's components of it. So what we're talking about when we know it, understand, we're talking about uh, inter interdisciplinary studies, how they interconnect with each other. Again, very important concept in the high set because one uh, area depends on another area. We also talk about our traditional uh, courses in mathematics, ELA. I have developed my own mathematics course for adults because I don't think that the K-12 mathematics is appropriate for them. Uh, entrepreneurship, having to do things with mod, you know, um, climate change, looking at what's going on in the world. And of course, the themes of global literacy, uh, very important, of course, is this idea of what's going on in climate change in the world and how it will affect our families and children. Uh, in the skills area, when we're talking about what we know and what we know, we're talking about the creativity, the critical thinking, the communication and the collaboration, those four C's of the Common Core and the um, College Career Readiness Standards. Uh, as far as character, very important, you know, how we're behaving in the world our mindfulness, our curiosity about what's going on, our courage, our resilience, our ethics and leadership. And we see that resilience in our students as adults, right? Of, you know, I have a woman who's couch surfing now because she can't afford an apartment in Monterey County for her, herself and her, you know, her kids. So she's living with her parents. Ethics, see it all the time in, in our, you know, national politics, leadership, taking leadership roles. And of course, in the meta learning, of our metacognition and the importance of a growth mindset that we can learn more than today than we, than we did yesterday and we'll know more tomorrow than we do today. Uh, that we're always moving forward. So um, Fado, but Bialik, Fado from uh, Harvard University, Bialik and Trilling uh, wrote that in the classroom, these four dimensions are all intertwined. Effective learning is a rich blend of the elements from all of them. In fact, the best learning experiences in schools around the world already integrate all these different learning aspects without necessarily referring to them explicitly. And what they use uh, typically is a, this sort of a Venn diagram where the knowledge, skills, and character all interact for the 21st century education, but we're also overall overarching is this meta learning, how we reflect and adapt, how we are resilient, how we learn, what, how we understand what we're learning and developing a growth mindset that we move forward with this. So um, we worked, as I mentioned, uh, with a group from uh, New Zealand, uh, Brian Annan and Mary Wooten. Um, and one of the things that uh, we did previously with them, they have a, a website called Infinity Learning Map where they work with the prisons in Australia and New Zealand, prim primarily, but also in other countries. And it, if you reflect in, on what you are learning and living and make little adjustments along the ways, you would develop positive ways to survive and thrive as you move into the future. If you skip making those little adjustments, you are likely to fall behind, to struggle, and to possibly join negative networks that take you down pathways that are not good for you. And of course, working with incarcerated adults, this is exactly what we're, we're seeing. Um, anecdotally, in the last five years working, because I, we individually in, in, you know, interview each adult that we work with. What 
I found in anecdotally is for men and for males, it seems like 44 is a critical year for men of going back and reflecting on where they are and where they've been. I had one 44 year old man tell me he had been either in prison or in jail for 19 of the last, you know, 20 some years. So, um, you know, and he wanted to make a change. 49 is another big one for men, it seems. Uh, more and more men come to me all the time talking about how they need to make a change, get their high school diploma, get their high set in their 40s. Women, it seems, is about 15 years earlier. 29 seems to be one of the critical moments for women and into their er, er, mid, early and mid 30s. And uh, that has to do a lot with the fact that they all talk about their children and being an example for their children. So this idea of making adjustments is very important uh, in our education with these incarcerated adults. Uh, this is one uh, of uh, a graphic. Uh, let me get Miss Fella in the in admit um, of of how these uh, metacognition uh, influence our our local learning agenda agendas in the different areas. Uh, these this. Presentation is also in uh, a link in the Google Drive, which I, I will show you at the end. So you can go back and use it if you'd like as a PDF form. Um, also, we have uh, just another way of looking at it. Um, one of the things that we've, we found out here in California, of course, uh, you know, through the research, uh, through Stanford University, et cetera, is that about 80% of teachers in the K-12 schools are uh, audio linguistic learners. However, somewhere around 85% of our students are not. And of course, the students that thrive in the environment tend to be learners who learn in the same way that their teachers are teaching us. I particularly am not an audio linguistic learner. I'm more of a visual learner. So I focus a lot on kinesthetic and verbal and you know, visual learning in my working with students, because that's the way that I've, I learn and, I, and many of them are much the same way as me. So let's go to the high set. So we used an online and paper, we've used both an online and a paper-based curriculum. Uh, as I said, we took over the jail program in 2018, but by the time we actually got into the classroom, uh, or 2017 actually got into the classroom, it's 2018. And then of course we were doing distance learning during the pandemic starting in 2020. And we were on lockdown, we were off lockdown. It's been a, it's been a mess. We have finally gotten back into in-person instruction uh, for both men and for women in, uh, in uh, August of 2022 was the first time we were able to get back into the classroom. We do the high, set, high school diploma. We have uh, our requirements are 170 credits for adults now. We got it approved by the Board of Education. Uh, we also do the high school equivalency, but we only do the high set. We do not do the GED anymore. We stopped doing that in about 2014. And we use online curriculum of Edgenuity, which we also use with our uh, K-12 programs. And uh, we also have a um, open door charter, which focuses only on high school diploma for adults, uh, 16 through 99. So my big idea uh, here with working with uh, high set adults is to focus on a few questions. First of all, what skills do adults in the high set and high school diploma program really need? What are the th things that these skills that make these adults successful, and referring back to what Brian and Mary said about how to make adjustments and be resilient in, in, the, in, their, in their future lives? And, and I personally do not think it's the same skills that we want the nine to 12 students to learn, because I think the skill set needs to be different. There are different needs. And then finally, what is the really the difference between adult needs uh, for learning in, and high school students needs for learning? Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd like to mention is uh, when I started working in alternative education in 1997, uh, I was working with uh, Steve Johnson from Santa Clara University. He was kind of the guru 
of alternative education in Northern California and Central California. And one of the things that he said is the difference between college students and the, that he works with and the adult students, which were of course mostly teachers at that time or educational staff, was that for the adult learners, it needs to be relevant to what they're doing. They're not interested in learning just for the sake of learning and experiencing the most varied curriculum as possible. It needs to be applicable to what they need in their own lives. And I think this is very true for all the adults that we work with. Um, so my skills focus and our skills focus in the high set and the high school diploma are first of all, problem solving skills. How do we as adults solve our problems? And not only the educational problems. How do we develop crit critical thinking skills in adults that allow them to look you know, critically at things that are going on around them and in their lives and in, you know, in their jobs and, and moving forward with their, their children and whatever's going on in their lives? Critically important, I also think, is data analysis. And this is also from Joe Bowler, who's on the Board of Education for the state of California. Statistical information skills. How do we see and understand our statistical information that is bombarded on, on us all the time? And of course, during the pandemic, we saw that there was a lot of misinformation that was sent out. How do we evaluate that misinformation? And then general knowledge skills are also part of the, the idea is just the general background knowledge of how we interact with our, ourselves, our governments and our community. And then finally, the metacognition, our reflecting and our adapting to our environment and to available information so that we can be resilient and move forward with our lives. So these are kind of the, the areas that the skills areas that we focus on in our adult education program. How does this work now? So when we're talking about problem solving skills, I'm sort of thinking about how do we approach a problem, especially for the high set, to help us foster an understanding of what the problem is actually about and what it's asking us. Um, then how, how does close reading apply to our understanding of the problem? Because if you look at the high set curriculum, the high set test, your, your reading, your social studies, and your science, and to a certain extent, your math, and certainly your writing, all use the same basic approach of having some kind of a reading, content area is different, information is different, asking problems about that reading, or, ask, or having problems about that reading, and looking at the information that is in the reading and having a, a close reading so you can understand what you're looking for and where to look for the answers. So let's take a look at, so we, one of the, the things that we use when we started in the jail program, I bought a 2000 version of Monmetrics High Set Secrets uh, in order to, to work with the adults in the jail. So this problem is specifically from the 2018 version of Monmetrics. I cannot give you the problems because you know, it's copyrighted, but, uh, and you, but you can go online. There's a link at the end that you could go online and you can buy it if you'd like to and buy a copy, online copy. We also have a 2014 version, which is quite similar, but we had the paper-based copy at that time. So this is the first problem of the Mometrics High Set Secrets in Social Studies. Important dates of the international slave trade. This is, a, this is the problem that I have to use with all my students and go over information about how they should approach these, this test. 1517, Spain begins regular sl slave trading. 1592, Britain begins regular slave trading. Of course, we're missing 1619 for the United States. Um, 1792, Denmark ab abolishes the slave trade. 1794, we've got France. It's 1807, Britain abolishes the slave trade. 1834, Britain abolishes slave in the, all the colonies. 1865, United States abolishes slavery. And 1888, Brazil abolishes slavery. So this is the, 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 the chart that's given at the beginning of the prob three, three problems that apply to this that we're gonna look at right now. What we see is that 
the first question is, which nation was the first to abolish slavery? Okay, if we go back to the chart, what our students are seeing is they're seeing abolish slavery. So I had a, one of my 44 year old students who I work independently with, um, he actually had the right answer, but he then he looked at this abolished slavery, he went back and he changed his answer. Because what they're looking at here is they're looking at uh, the literal meanings of the words. We've got this chart and what they're seeing is they're seeing abolishes slavery. They're not seeing that when you abolish the slave trade, you effectively are abolishing slavery. So they will often answer that 1834 or even 1865 was the first, we were the first country to abolish slavery. When in fact, the answer is 1792, Denmark was the first, the first country to abolish the slave trade, as far as the chart goes. So very important that they look at, they read closely and they understand the meaning of the words and the phrases. And this is what we emphasize with, with our, our, our students uh, as far as learning to the close reading and understanding the information that's given to them. Second question on this, this, for this part is, if the United States had not won the Revolutionary War, when would slavery have been outlawed? Of course, the main issue here is, do they know that the United States was a colony of, of Great Britain prior to our Revolutionary War in 17, and our Declaration of Independence in 1776? And so this is the background knowledge that we have to foster, and part of that general knowledge of understanding that, yes, in fact, you know, we were a colony of Britain. And when we look back at that chart, it says that Britain abolishes slavery in all the colonies in 1834. So we look at that and this is what, where the answer comes up again. But being able, knowing that information that we were a colony of Britain is critically important prior to our you know, independence. Then last question is kind of interesting because this is one that we can delve a lot more into the combination of world history and US history. So which of the following conclusions is valid based on your prior knowledge and the information from the chart above, right? More slaves worked in Brazil than in any other nation. France realized its ideas of independence sooner than the United States. Denmark was the largest slaveholding country in Europe and Britain freed enslaved peoples only after losing the nations of the British empire. So my question to you, and you could answer in the chart or however OTAN lets you answer, is approximately how many slaves were in the US in 1863 at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation? So who would like to give me an answer for this? Maybe somebody raised their hand or... Anybody? Yes. Come on, we're all over the 1619 project. No, I, I can't see the chat. So um, <laughs> do we have anybody in the chat that's given us an answer? No, not yet. Not uh, yet. Oh my gosh. You did great. <laughs> <laughs> To do it. According to librarycommerce.gov, it was 3,952,000. Okay, so yeah, my, my information is, is that there were approximately a million. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So that's, I'll have to change that as what I told the students. So yeah, over a million slaves, definitely in the United States at the time of 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation was. Okay, so, but the question is, were more slaves worked in Brazil than any other nation? That information is not given in the chart. So my second question is, is then, here's a question, and approximately how many slaves were in Brazil in 1888 at the end of slavery? Any ideas? Yeah. 
it was approximately 10 times as many as in the United States. So, you know, the, the general number that I've come seen is about 10 million. So Brazil was the largest slave owning, owning com, or slavery, I don't know how to put it even, uh, country in, in the Americas in the 19th century. Um, but do we, do we know that more slaves worked in Brazil than any other nation? No, we don't, because we don't have that information. We do know that there were a lot and it was more than the United States, but we don't know if that's where, where that is in relation to the rest of the world not based on the information that they gave us here or the, our background information. So this is, these are kind of important ideas about you know, where we are and where we've, where we've been and where we're going, right? Uh, secondly, let's take a look at this. Uh, so it said Britain's freed enslaved people only after losing the Asian nations of the British empire. When did a, most of our students don't know when the Asian nations of the British Empire became independent, but when was that? After the World War II. Well, yeah, it was in the 20th century, right? Significantly before Britain outlawed slavery, after Britain outlawed slavery, and after you know, the United States Civil War and all the other things of the 19th century that were on that list, the 18th and 19th century. So that obviously is not well. We also know from our geography, and our students should know this from the geography part of the test, is Denmark likely was not the largest slaveholding country in Europe because it's an extremely small country, and it was the first country to outlaw slavery. So that doesn't make sense. So the only reasonable answer is that France realized its ideals of independence sooner than the United States. And do we, does anyone have an idea what the motto of France is, of the revolution in France? Ah, beautiful. Yes. Does it get a gold star? <laughs> it's a gold star. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And of course, uh, our Spanish speaking students uh, will automatically know what, what these words are. English speaking students also, most of them will know that really, you know, liberty, equality, and brotherhood were the motto of the French Revolution and are the motto of France today. So they, since they freed their slaves in 1794, I think it was, the revolution was 18, 1789. They were uh, they realized their ideas of independence sooner than we did, because we didn't free our slaves until almost 180, four score and seven years after the Declaration of Independence. Okay, good, very good, gold star. Okay, this is a problem that uh, my co-teacher George, who's a social studies, says, "What the fuck are they talking about here? This doesn't make any sense." <laughs> This comes from an ETS a free test from 2013. The question looks like this. Although the numbers are not included on either axis, it is possible to determine from the shape and location that the equation Y equals negative 1.2X plus four corresponds to which graph? So, any ideas? R. That's the only negative. Okay, so yes, so T and Q are exponential uh, equations. They're inverses of each other, right? One uh, Q is, has a positive, um, a positive, and uh, T is probably a, a, a fractional exponential. U is X equals some number. In this case, it happens to be two, about two. S is a, has a positive slope. So R is the only one that is possible. And with, this is a very important concept on the math high set, the, probably the most important uh, equation or function that you see on the high set is to understand the formula Y equals MX plus B. And in this case, M equals negative 1.2. So the slope is negative and that would be R. It's also, if you notice that S, even if they guessed S because it's a straight line, the Y intercept would not be a positive number, would be a negative number. 
and the y-intercept in this case is four. So this, we spend a lot of time on problems like this to build our understanding of how we recognize what the functions look like and what information we can gather just by knowing a few basic, basic steps of what it means, the function means, and the equation means. And Brian got it right, Mr. Lidwa. Brian got it right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we approach the problem to foster understanding or a deeper understanding of what they're actually trying to ask us? So um, I'd like, I, one of the big ideas that we have is that we connect the problem to our learned experience. So this is a problem from ETS again. Again, the map below shows Gogola. A large island that is divided into two independent nations, Braga and Matsu. A uh, high mountain range extends north and south about 50 miles from Braga's western coast. And you see a picture of the map there. And I, don't, I can't see my, my notes because I have the apps in the way. But um, how do we interpret this map? How do we, you know, how do we understand what's going on with this map? But this map is. This map is a map of California, basically, right? So if we look at this map, 2013 it was, sorry. Yeah, that's right. So the question is, if the prevailing winds come from the West, which of the following statements about rainfall in Braga must be likely true? Well, if we look at the map of Braga, right? What do we have? We have winds coming from the West, right? Over the Western Sea, like that. Okay. Let's take a look at it. So here's our connection to the problem. Here's our map, a closer look at the map. What do we got? The Western Sea is our Pacific Ocean. There's the Monterey Bay and the Monterey Peninsula. We've got the Santa Lucia Mountains on the coastal range. Now remember, we're in Salinas, so we are in Monterey County. Big Sur, southern part of the Santa Lucia, south of the Monterey Peninsula. And what's on the other side of the mountains? There we go, the Salinas Valley. So we've got an exact replica of Monterey County in the, in the, the, the country of Braga, which you're talking about. Where does the rain fall? Well, the mountains catch the rain, so it falls on the coast. Consequently, Big Sur is considered a temperate rainforest with about 36 inches of average rain a year. The Monterey Peninsula gets about 17 inches, and the Salinas Valley gets rain also, but from the mountains along the eastern valley, running down the slopes, uh, which is where the Pinnacles Monument is and Fremont Peak is. But it's almost an exact replica of what Monterey County looks like. And it's connecting that idea to our own learned experience of, yes, this is where we live. What is going on in our own place? How do we apply it to this information that they're asking us about? So the correct answer would be, yeah, the, the rain falls along the coast because the mountains are catching the clouds and dropping the rain on Big Sur. And the, the southern coast of Monterey County, San Luis Obispo County, et cetera. So, this idea of being able to connect it. I, we had a student who graduated last year, uh, and she was uh, she was reading uh, Wuthering Heights for us, and it describes the the, the trees uh, uh, in um, in Wuthering Heights how they're they're stunted because of the no wind off of the North Sea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I asked her, did she ever notice what the trees looked like? in along the coast in Monterey or in that area. And uh, I took a few pictures of actually a pine tree and a cypress tree, which is in my backyard, my neighbor's backyard. And the pine tree is completely bare on the north face where the wind comes off of the bay. Um, and it, it, it's an exact description of what is described in Weathering Heights. So this idea of connecting uh, our problem to our own learned experience and how it, how it how it is how we can understand it. So there's the there's the answer. So the answer in this case was there will be 
more rainfall along the coast and in the areas east of the mountains, that would be the answer for D, just like it is in Monterey Cali County and along the coast of much of California. Looking at critical thinking skills, you know, what, again, what background knowledge can I apply to the problem that will help me to understand how to solve it and what, what the answer is? Is this question supported by the data and information in the readings? And then finally, does it make sense from a rational, scientific, or logical standpoint? And of course, in our national politics since you know 19, since the 2020, a lot of what has been you know published and put forward is neither makes sense either from a rational, scientific, or logical standpoint, right? And so we need to be able to critically think of what we are evaluating and how this helps us then to have high success. So let's take a look here at another problem. Um, now, a lot of students don't have a lot of experience with the, you know, the genetic makeup or what we call the Punnett square. So the allies, uh, allylates are different forms of a gene of a trait for a certain dog, the long hair allylate is dominant, the short hair LLA is recessive. They should be able to understand that the dominant is always gonna come out. And for this breed, the two genes of the two parents and the possible gene combination of their offspring are shown in the chart below, right? So you got the female parent that has short hair, the male parent has long hair because the male parent has the dominant gene for long hair. So when we look at it, which of the following best describes the hair of the two parents? Pretty straightforward question. The male parent has long hair, the female parent has short hair because the male has the dominant trait for long hair and the female has two recessive genes, right? So th that's pretty clear. But what about this idea if the female parent had one long hair LLA, what would be the expected percent of the offspring with long hair? Well, how does the student solve that problem? So what we talk to them about is you've got this breed, right? There's our, our short-haired female, a long-haired male. And when we're looking at number seven, what we're going to encourage them to do is to duplicate that Punnett square with the information that's given. In other words, you've got the female with a dominant long hair and a recessive short hair the male with the dominant long hair and recessive short hair, what do we end up with? We end up with two dominant long hair and a dominant short, a recessive short hair, and then one dominant for both on both sides of the, of the other one. Three out of four will have, of the offspring will likely have long hair. Three fourths, that's 75 cents. Three quarters of a dollar is 75 cents. The answer is clearly then 75%. Connecting money, the idea of money to percentages is an important concept that I've been teaching in math for 38 years. Because our kids and our adults all know about money. <laughs> A little bit about money from the time they were, my three-year-old granddaughter knows how much a nickel is worth and how much a quarter is worth. And there's, it's better to have a quarter than it is to have a nickel, right? So they've been using it for a long time, using that idea, again, that 75%, 100 cents to the dollar, connecting it to the idea of percents because all kids hate percents in, in middle school, and, but they are important to learning and succeeding as an adult. So uh, trying to bring those ideas together and make it important in information. Um, so here's some, something else. Uh, I'm going to go over a uh, a little a way that uh, I teach writing for the high set. Uh, this is an example from the two, one of the 2013 ETS. It's a very easy example to show students how to organize their thoughts into a coherent essay. Um, staying physically fit involves practicing habits such as exercising regularly, eating well, and getting enough sleep. Remember that the, more, the most important part of the essay is the organization. Can I take what's up in my brain, put it on paper so that when you read it, you understand what I'm trying to say? And does it follow a lot, some kind of a logical pattern? Research has shown that people who are physically fit, fit 
perform better at school and work. Your employer is printing a special newsletter informing employees about the important ways they can practice staying physically fit. And then a persuasive essay. Now, all the essays on the high set are almost all persuasive essays. And there are about eight different ways that you can persuade somebody to, to, for, to something. I never remember all eight of them, but we do uh, can talk about things like quoting an expert. Now, you want to quote a reasonable expert or a, a, an expert that applies to the situation. For instance, we know Einstein is an expert, but he's probably not an expert on physical fitness. So we wouldn't want to necessarily quote um, Einstein as a, a specialist on physical fitness, but we might call, you know, quote our former governor. And I'm not talking about Jerry Brown, I'm talking about Schwarzenegger, of course, <laughs> uh, on physical fitness. But um, you, we could quote it, we can do something like, you know, it's, it's something, um, it's, a ge it's general knowledge that being physically fit makes you healthier. Uh, you can do general knowledge, you can do opinion, you can do things like the, our teenage kids have done to us when they want to go to a party on Friday night and we ask them if their homework's done and they say no, but mom, everybody's going to be at that party, I have to go to it, right? Everybody knows this to be true, right? So we can use those ideas. So here's how we would I would teach the students to form this essay. We're looking for a five paragraph essay. Remember, that's what they're looking for on the high set. You will pass with a three paragraph, a well-written three paragraph essay. You will not pass with a one paragraph or two paragraph essay. So we're gonna write a five paragraph essay really quickly. Paragraph one, we're doing write a topic sentence about what staying physically fit means. We're gonna write one sentence about exercise. We're gonna write one sentence about healthy eating. We're gonna write one sentence about getting enough sleep. And we're gonna write one concluding sentence about how our employer will support these good habits. Five, five sentences in my first paragraph. What happens next? We're still talking about physical fitness. We're talking about exercise. We're talking about fitness. My paragraph two, what happens in paragraph two? I'm going to write a topic sentence about exercise now. I'm gonna reword the sentence from my first paragraph to make it a topic sentence. I'm gonna write one supporting sentence with evidence, a second supporting sentence about exercise, a third supporting sentence about exercise, and at least one and a conclusion, again, of how the employer is gonna support these three ideas that we just talked about, about exercise. Paragraph three, what are we gonna talk about now? We're gonna talk about healthy eating. How, is the par how are we going to reword that first paragraph sentence about eating into a topic sentence? Supporting evidence, sentence two. Supporting evidence, sentence three. Supporting evidence, sentence four. And a conclusion about the, how the employer is going to support these things in the workplace for us. Paragraph four, what do you think it's gonna be about? It's gonna be about sleep. Why do employees not get enough sleep? Primarily because of their kids and school schedules. Trying to get their kids to school schedules, daycare, working around all those things. We're gonna follow that same basic pattern with sleep and say how we're going to do that. We've now got four paragraphs, 20 sentences, a uh, maximum. And all we have to do is write our fifth paragraph. So our fifth paragraph, what are we gonna do? We're gonna restate our topic sentence about staying fit from our first paragraph as a conclusion. We're gonna rework our concluding sentence from paragraph two about exercise. We're gonna reword our concluding sentence from paragraph three about eating healthy. We're gonna rework our concluding sentence from paragraph four about getting enough sleep. And we're gonna write one final concluding paragraph or sentence, excuse me, to wrap up the essay, tie it off in a bright, bright colored bow and hand that essay in for a score of four or five. Straightforward, very clear how to organize the essay so that 
it ties together, the pieces all tie together and are organized to one supporting the other going through it. Very easy, very easy way to write an essay, teach the students to write an essay for the high set exam. And this is a e very easy question, question to answer, as long as you're connecting it to the employer. Now, the big idea that I try to get through my kids, my students' head is that, they're not kids, they're adults, but is that you don't want to think of your employer being the mom and pop grocery store down on the corner. What you want to think of is what would a company like Google, Meta, you know, um, one of the big companies, tech companies with a lot of money be able to do to support their, their employees in practicing these habits that we just talked about? How do they do things where they got the money and unlimited limit amounts of money to, to give the employees these opportunities that we would not necessarily get from a, you know, a small shop on the corner or a local, very small local employer. So we would really want them to think big and think outside of the box and think of what would, you know, what would be the best thing that they could do about this, right? Okay, um, any questions so far about that or comments? Guys are still quiet, must be Friday afternoon. Um, so again, when I'm talking about data and statistical analysis, what is the data and the information telling me, right? Um, can I make sense of the information by using easy numbers? And I didn't actually get an, uh, a slide in for this, I forgot about it, but anyway, I'll, tell, I'll explain it to you. And where is the data and the information coming from? Is it a reliable source, right? Do we know, we just had um, Rupert Mur Murdoch go on, you know, in, in, say in court that he knew that the information that Fox News was presenting was false and he just let it go anyway because it, it kept their read, you know, their, the people viewing the, the information, right? And then how does the reading support this understanding of the data, right? So when we're looking at this data, right, Here's an example from ETS 2017, showing the 10 most popular uh, in US cities from 1800 to 2000. So we look at 1800, we see actually, the first thing I think I, I, most of the students see is that New York is the, is the biggest city all the way from 1800 to 2000, right? It's on the East Coast, first big city in the United States. But when we look down the column now, we see that every one of the cities in 1800 is on the East Coast or an Eastern, uh, an Eastern state, right? In other words, where's our immigration coming from? Where's our development coming from? It's coming across the Atlantic, right? It's coming you know, from, you know, from the East going West, right? By 1850, what do we have? We still got New York, Baltimore, Boston, Philadelphia, what do we know about New Orleans, though? It's not on the East Coast. However, it is a port on the Gulf of Mexico, right? So we now have information and transport coming in from the Gulf of Mexico into the ports of the South. Cincinnati, Ohio, where's Cincinnati? It's on a river. We've got movement in 1850 going up and down the rivers. St. Louis, Missouri is on the Mississippi, right? Albany, New York is on the Hudson. These are all, the big cities are all river cities or port cities still in 1850. So the movement is by ship, is over water, right? By 1900, all of a sudden Chicago shows up, right? Where's Chicago? On the Great Lakes. St. Louis has moved up now on the Mississippi. We still got Baltimore coming in, Cleveland, another one on the river, Ohio River, Buffalo, New York on the Hudson and Lake Erie. Ah, but now we've got San Francisco on the West Coast. It's also a port city on the West Coast, right? And by 1900, and of course, our students all have a, a pretty good idea of what the 49ers and you know the immigration and the, you know that time period around 1849 and 1850 is happening in, in California, right? By 1850, where are we going? We're still got kind of the same things. We're bringing in now Detroit, Motor City, right? Cleveland, Ohio, St. Louis, Washington DC becomes a bigger city as a center of government. 
But by 2000, all of a sudden, where are we at? We got Los Angeles moved up to second place. Chicago's in third place. Phoenix is now there. Houston, Texas. Movement is from the east, north, to now the west and to the southwest, right? We've got San Diego. We've got San Antonio. We've got Detroit. These are questions that are going to be asked about this chart. Is where, how does the movement move? Where is it coming from? And why is it coming, do it, going the way it is? What's going on here? And this is, the, this is a kind of understanding of looking deeper into the information that we need our, our adult students to look at. Where, how, what is making these changes, right? How, is it, how are these changes coming about and what's causing these changes in our, in our information? So um, how do I best learn? We talked a little bit about that. You know, what's our learning style? I have to tell you, I didn't really realize I was a visual kinesthetic learner until probably graduate school uh, when I had to learn a foreign language uh, because I was living in Europe and realized that the only way I could learn the language was by, was by practicing it and visualizing it. I also understood that by that time starting in high school that the only way I remember something is actually to write it down. I can't sit in the class and listen to the teacher without taking notes and understand it. So how do I best learn? Very important for them. What is my learning style? So I think this is a great failing of our educational system in high school is not helping students understand what their learning style is. Are they kinesthetic learners? Are they visual learners? Are they graphic learners? So when I start working with uh, adult students, I often ask them, you know, what would be a, a typical person that's a kinesthetic learner that uses their body to learn? And, you know, typically they won't come up with the idea that it's a dancer or a, a, a sports person, right? Um, because they're not, they don't think, and we don't teach them to think in that way, right? And how do they learn best? And then how do I maximize my test taking strategies to take advantages of my strengths and knowledge, right? And then also we look at this and this is an example of uh, one of our incarcerated um, men. Uh, this is a, actually a science test. P stands for physical science, E stands for earth science, L stands for life science. And, um, and he, when he took this test, he got this, his first time he took it, he got 13 out of 23 correct. So 57%, which isn't bad, but it's not exactly high set ready. But look at the, how he answered the question. Now I understand that this is really a very limited supply since it's only a one, one example of what he's doing. And I'd like to see much more than this. But if I look at it, I notice that out of the first four questions, he's gotten two wrong. In fact, the first two wrong. He skipped five and six. But then at question seven, which is life science, which typically is one of the harder sciences for our students, he got everything from seven to 15 right, except for one question. Then on 16, he got distracted. One, two, three, four out of five wrong again, up to 20. And then at the end, he probably was rushing to finish and he got two of those wrong. What's going on with this kid, with this kid, right? Or with the student, right? Well, first of all, what I see is that the first part of the test, like me, he wasn't in the testing zone. He wasn't thinking about the testing. He wasn't looking at the information. So when I talk to this student, I'm gonna tell him, what do you need to do? When you, you need to leave yourself time at the end of the test to finish the test and go back and look at those first, say, 10 questions or so and see that if you understood what they were actually talking about. Because at the number seven, he apparently all of a sudden is, is started into, the, into what's going on with his test because now he's showing what he can actually do, right? He probably, be, he, he's incarcerated. He probably got distracted between 16 and 20 with something going on. But, um, but it gives us information that we can use to help our students maximize their knowledge and experience and efforts in order to you know, do the best that they can on these. 
okay? And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for them to do the best they can. I'm not expecting them to be brilliant, but I'm expecting them to do the best they can. Um, I, ex I would say that general knowledge on the HICID is, the, and, and for the JED, since the common core standard is probably the least important component. But you really have to have a basic understanding of what came first and how it affected what comes after it. In other words, this idea of cause and effect. Okay, so we're gonna take a look a little bit about this. There's not much world history on the high set. It more is how the world history interacts with US history. In other words, they're not gonna ask us what year Caesar Augustus was, you know, emperor of Rome or you know, what happened in ancient Rome or, or Alexander the Great, but they will be uh, expecting us to understand how world history and US history interact with each other. So we're gonna take a quick look at a, a kind of a, a little timeline that I tend to do. So typically the first industrial revolution is, starts around 1770, and they say that it goes to 1830. It's almost exclusively limited to Britain because Britain, passed a law that limited the export of machinery in the early 19, 19th century. So it kind of gets stuck. So, but the two big ideas here is we get the invention of the steam engine. Anybody know when the steam engine was invented? The approximate date? 1823. Uh, actually 1783 was the first version of the steam engine. Well, that was a good guess. That's what I usually tell students. <laughs> it was actually 1783, around 1783. And then we have the invention of the spinning jenny, which is actually the first machine driven power loom uh, in, in history, right? So what, what happens to that? When, when we, all of a sudden we get the spinning jenny, what happens in England? They go from a cottage-based economy of, you know, people sitting in their homes, primarily women, making clothes and selling them to the rich people of Europe to factories in London, stuck, stacked with these power looms now, making clothes uh, and you know, having people come into the city to make the power looms. So there's this movement from the countryside to the city, not because it was necessarily what they wanted, it was because that's where the jobs now go. This industrial revolution caused this movement from the rural to the urban because of the invention of machines. Then we get the second industrial revolution around 1850, and they say that it goes until about 1914. But the big important parts of it are at the beginning. We get the invention of steel around 1850. What does that have, what does that do for us? We get the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania around 1859. And because now all of a sudden we have a fuel that burns hotter and cleaner and faster than coal, we get the industrial production of, of steel coming around 1870. So how one thing affects what's going on after it and how, we can understand certain things because of something that went before it. But what's, what, what does it mean? Well, we've got the Civil War, 1865 to 1860, uh, 1861 to 1865, excuse me. Okay, what's important with the Civil War? You probably have heard it stated many times that more uh, Americans' troops were killed in the Civil War than all the rest of the wars put together. Why? Anybody have a reason why that happened? By we ourselves. <laughs> What's Technology. that? Technology, we're fighting ourselves. Well, we're fighting ourselves, certainly. That, that had something to do with it. But yes, technology. Because of steel and this brilliant person named Springfield the Springfield Rifled Musket of 1861. These muskets were used during the war. Now the, they're rifled. They actually have a bullet that's oblong like the bullets we see today. The bullet comes out of the musket spinning. So it actually goes straighter and you hit your target. They're still fighting the war like they did in the 
16th century at the, the where where you got two lines of troops standing on each side of the valley firing at each other, but they're firing muskets and they're not hitting each other, right? But now all of a sudden you got this rifled musket, still only one shot, but they're hitting each other. He also invents interchangeable parts. So you're no longer a farmer with a musket who breaks his or her trigger or hammer, has to take the musket into the blacksmith in town, the blacksmith disassembles it, takes out the broken part, forges a new part for it, puts it back in, and then eventually gets it back to the, the farmer for his hunting. So you've got this long period of time of replacing these. All of a sudden, they're taking this spring field, they're taking, sending it back to the back lines. You've got people there that are interchanging the parts and it's back in action right away. So you have this idea of interchangeable parts, which of course Henry Ford uses in developing his, his, his cars, right? The other thing about the Springfield rifled musket is that you get three aim shots per minute. Takes you, you can put three bullets in that gun and fire them and aim them uh, in, in per minute. Anybody have an idea how long it takes to reload a musket? From the 18th century Revolutionary War? Two, minutes, three, three. Two or three minutes, exactly. So now we've got a gun that will fire nine times as fast as that musket did in the 18th century, and it's firing bullets that actually hit the target, right? Uh, a, a longer range target. So yes, there's a reason that, and the other thing, big thing is, is about 70, 80% of wounded troops die of infections or of their wounds of, on the battlefield. So that is, of course, a big, a big part of, of the, 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 but remember, we got this invention of steel in 1850, which allows for this rifled muff, musket now. And then we have the development of railroads. Originally, railroad tracks were made of wood. Of course, they found out that that's not the greatest material for railroad tracks since they don't last very long. Uh, they tried making them out of uh, iron, but iron is very brittle and breaks easily. So we really didn't have effective railroads until we have the invention of steel, which is not only flexible, but has tensile strength and is long lasting. By 1869, we have them driving the golden spike in the transcontinental railroad, which then adds to the development of the West, which is what we saw in that movement from the east to the to the west in the development building of the cities, right? And then we have the invention of the skyscraper, first skyscraper, 1885 in Chicago, Illinois, first building with a metal skeleton inside, holding up the floors and the walls. Previously, you were limited to about 20 stories when you're building with brick or stone, because as you move the as you go higher, you have to make thicker walls. The weight of the stone crushes what's underneath it, and you, at some point you 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 can't get any inside space because of all the thickness of the walls and the weight of the walls crushing down on each other. Right, so we get the invention of the skyscraper in 1865. Sullivan actually designed a building at the turn of the 20th century that was designed to be a mile high. It was never built, but he he came up with an idea of how you could build a mile high building. By, by the beginning of the 20th century. So here we go. Let's look at one other idea here. So we just said that 78% of wounded troops die of wounds and infections. There are minimal antiseptics and poor hygiene on the battlefield, but we do get the beginning of the Red Cross and beginning of field treatments that where the soldiers are being taken to field hospitals uh, and helping to save some of the soldiers, right? By World War I, we've got now 50 to 52% of wounded troops dying of their wounds and infections. We do in fact have better hygiene and better antiseptics. So what's the big difference? How do we manage to save 25% more troops from, from wounds and infections during World War I? Ideas? Sulfur drugs. What's that? Sulfur drugs. No, sulfur didn't come later. I don't think sulfur came later. I don't think, sir. 
I'm not sure, but yeah, I think so. But we do have the introduction of field ambulances and field hospitals. Think, think Hemingway, right? The, and they're not only are there they're field ambulances, but they're actually using vehicles now instead of horse-drawn carriages, right? To get these uh, soldiers off the battlefield and into the hospitals and away from the battlefield. So they're moving the, the wounded faster from the battlefield. But we're stuck at still about 50% of wounded troops dying of their wounds and infections. Then we come to World War II and now 1939 to 1945, we're down, we got it down to about 25% of wounded troops dying of infections. And that's primarily because of the invention of penicillin. And the first antibiotics, like you said, the sulfa drugs, better drugs, but we also have better antiseptics, we have better hygiene, we have more rapid trans transport to hospitals with these, these troops. We're still talking about 25% of troops dying though, right? Just from wounds. Basically in the Korean War and the Vietnam War, we're still at around that 25 to 20% dying of wounds and infections. And there's a reason for this because we kind of maximized our use of antibiotics. We maximized our, you know, our, our medical skills and hygiene. But we do have a, one thing that has we improved it slightly. And this was this idea of the mobile air ambulances, you know, the MASH units, getting troops off the field faster and into, you know, surgical hospitals saves another five, five to 10% of those troops, right? And this last thing that I want to talk about, so we're, we're not only talking about medical science, we're also talking about technology, right? Gulf War, 1990, the Iraq War, 2003 to 2010, war in Afghanistan, 1999 to 2021, we got it down to less than 10% of troops dying of their wounds. But because of that, we now have these horrific troops coming back with these horrific injuries that we don't know, at least we're just beginning to understand how to take care of and to treat, right? But what, what was the big change here? That we go from 20, 20, 20 25% down to less than 10%? I was, I was shocked when I saw that number actually in the, in the publication that I was reading. Why is this huge change? Any yeah. ideas? Fourteen Second? minutes to go, Mr. Ludwa. Okay, fourteen minutes to go. It's development of artificial blood, artificial plasma. 1983, we've got the HIV epidemic. They're looking for an artificial way to bolster the blood supply without because of, of, of HIV, and they come up with this what it's called ringer solution. It's basically a salt solution. But what happens is we get the development of artificial plasma, artificial blood. It does not have to be refrigerated and the medics can carry this artificial blood into the field and the soldiers do not bleed out before they can get to a surgical hospital, right? So um, let's go ahead and move ahead. Um, I actually use a process that we call productive struggle and I'm gonna show you what that looks like. We're not interested in getting correct answers. We're interested in their struggle to learn and understand. Okay. So here we go. Moser's brain research at Michigan State University said, demonstrated two responses when we make a mistake. We get this ERN response, which is increased electroactivity with the brain experiences conflict between a correct response and an error. And we get a PE response with the brain signaling conscious attention to the mistake. Then we look at it a little bit further, Joe Bowler, Stanford University, researchers found also that the greater responses are when they make mistakes than when their answers were correct. And the brain activity was greater following mistakes for individuals with a growth mindset than for individuals with a fixed mindset. And finally, the research shows that Mistakes are opportunities for our brains to spark and grow. So I don't care that students make mistakes. 
I care that they try to figure out what those mistakes are. And there are not only opposite opportunities for learning, but they are actually opportunities for our brains to physically grow, even if we don't know we made the mistake. So we go ahead and we, our brains are growing in when we're making mistakes, but not when we're getting the right answers. So getting the right answer is, bad, is actually bad for learning. So I'm gonna skip through this one. I use uh, three, two to three test versions of these free practice tests that ETS put out. I think uh, they're being charged, you get charged from now. I do go and have them do a Mometrics, uh, which are 40 or 50, and then I do very difficult questions. But I'm gonna show you what that looks like uh, since we're running out of time here. So the first time they take the test, they do the problems, they do try to take it themselves, they can ask everybody. We correct the answers and we return it to the student. Then the student goes and corrects their mistakes, this productive struggle, they're working towards a solution, they're not guessing. They can work with a partner, they can collaborate to help better understand the question. And if we go and do it a third time, then we work with the remaining questions with the teacher or the aide to focus on the big ideas and the content background. So what it looks like is it looks like something like this. So this is the same student that we looked at before, Sotero. This is also a science test, uh, but it was graded a little bit differently. It was talked about analysis, synthesis, interpretation. So uh, it's an old version of the test. They didn't break it up according to uh, language, but you'll notice that he got 16 out of 25 right uh, the first time he did it, right? And he's kind of at this point, you know, on and off, but we don't have the, the same pattern that we, we showed in the previous time, excuse me. What we have here now is I break it down and I tell them what they're getting. So eight out of 11, 73% on inference, analysis, six out of 10, 60%, synthesis and generalization. Of course, these are all from Bloom's taxonomy, 50%, but our reading social studies are all focusing on the inference and interpretation areas and the analysis, less on the synthesis, and less on the comprehension in all three of these sets. Finally, we look at it this way. The first time he did this particular test, he got eight out of 23. Corrected it, gave it back to him. The second time he did it, he got 25 out of 20, 20 out of 25, because he had skipped 16 and 22 the first time. Then we would go over this again a third time and go over the few the five questions that he got wrong and talk to him about those particular five questions. But this is basically the procedure that we use. Um, this is about the fine and learning technique. Um, I'm gonna skip through this. Uh, Feynman of course is a Nobel prize winner in physics. The ultimate test of your knowledge is your ability to transfer it to another. Uh, this, is, this is an example of our students now. Our students typically will choose to take the reading or, and or social studies first. I consider the reading sort of the gateway test. If the st students have taken at least two tests, if they drop out after two, two tests or before, they're, they're testing at about a 71% range on the reading. However, if they go on and take at least two tests and go on to the third test, they're testing, they're passing the reading at a 98, almost a 98% passing rate. Social studies were about a 92% passing rate. These are all incarcerated, by the way. Uh, science, 93% passing rate. Math, of course, is the most difficult for most students, about 83%. But I, I actually have a 100% passing rate on my essays. I do have one student that didn't pass, but he basically didn't write the essay. He, he, he had like, you know, 19 and 20s on his other tests and decided he didn't have to do it. And then overall in writing, about a 92% passing rate on writing. Uh, high scores were in the 20s, 19s and 20s. Uh, median scores were in the six, 13s to 15s on the high set. Uh, perfect score would be 20. Uh, 
minimum score would be two, I guess, or somewhere around there. So we're, we're achieving these rates because of following this idea of productive struggle. For the students on the outside, we have quite a few less students on the outside and we haven't had an opportunity to test, but you'll notice that we have very similar rates on the outside for our outside students, 92% on the reading, 100% on the social studies, 92% um, on the science, 90% on the math, and 100% again on the writing. Um, now, again, these don't necessarily mean they only took the test one time, but they, they're their highest score on the test. And sometimes they will have to take the test twice, uh, very seldom three times. Um, but uh, these are the way that we, re we get these because of the way we focus on the idea of pro productive struggle and you know, accessing that background knowledge. We do have uh, use ingenuity to a certain extent, not very much, um, which is our online curriculum, because we find that they spend a lot of time doing stuff which they don't actually need, because it's really more of a high school curriculum. And um, let me just skip through this a little bit, the different courses that we have in ingenuity. Uh, workforce readiness is we do with, uh, and Maribel has taken charge of that. And she, we have about 16 industry certifications. And we do also 10 local certifications, including certified nursing assistant prep, counseling and mental health and family and community services. And then uh, we have, uh, they've been adding new ones. So we have a new, we had a new one added recently, which is residential construction skills which we, were, uh, we start out with our te construction technology, and then we put them into the residential construction skills from the Housing Bureau of Alabama. And then see what else we got. Uh, 23 certification courses. Uh, the, the text is a PowerPoint or video. We give them printed materials and interactive components, and they have to do the assessments online. We're using Atlo as our secure online uh, server. So uh, I didn't, I focused on Atlo in 2021. So I didn't add it today to this one because I figured I wouldn't have enough time. Certificates come from these different companies. So we do a personal financial literacy certification. We also do a principles of small engine technology. And as I said, now we've got the construction, uh, professional communications, et cetera. Um, we have been trying to put together construction trades programs. We do have one at our community school up at Rancho Cielo that has four career technical education, uh, but it's not technically part of us, though we can send students up there to enroll in their uh, ag technology, ag welding, uh, building trades, and then also their uh, diesel, diesel mechanics. Of course, Salinas being the bread, one of the bread baskets of the United States has a lot of agricultural needs. So um, the Google Drive has the PowerPoints and the demonstration documents. Um, we can put this into the chat um, and then you can take a look at some of the things that we talked about if you'd like, or you can email Maribel and I um, and uh, we're both at monterecoe.org, G. Ludwa or M. A. Hernandez, um, and you know, and I'll send you the link to the Google Drive and the PowerPoint uh, information. Uh, as I said, some of this stuff is copyrighted, so I couldn't put it into the Google Drive. But uh, a lot of the stuff was free, free educational use, so it, it it is in there. And then this is just our references. Um, so uh, anything, and also the, 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 the PowerPoint is in the Google Drive uh, PDF format. If you'd like to use it, you feel free to use it or any information from it. 